All right, hey guys, welcome back to Some Dumb Gaijin, and I am your host, JJ. ba 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 So a lot of shit is happening in the world, like just, whoo! Since our last podcast, what was it? They stormed the capital of the U.S. and broke into the White House and all this craziness. The government has released 2,007 pages of UFO evidence and no one gives a damn. And uh, recently, some actor just claimed cannibalistic messages to someone talking about they want to chop off people's body parts and then eat them and that's their sexual fantasy. Which is actually weird because on that note, I have a really funny story for you guys. <laughs> um, basically, I was on the shoot of this movie and there was this guy that was like, uh, I forget what the fuck he did. I think he was like paying money to sponsor the film or something. But he was like this uh, guy from India and... He just kept weirdly looking at the main actress in the movie. And I guess he went up to her and told her that he wanted to cut her up and eat her. Or that that was his fantasy. And he's like, I know that it's wrong, but I'd like to chop you up and eat you. What do you think about that? And then she told me and I was just like, God damn. And we're doing a horror movie too. Like this film was a flat out horror movie. And this guy was not even acting in it. He was his own horror movie there. And she told me this story and I was just like, I don't know what to say. Do we drive a stake through his heart? Like, this guy is messed up. And then besides that, another actress on another film in that weird film series. By the way, that movie is not coming out. Um, it was about like a killer Bigfoot. And I was an actor in that. And I was super pumped to have a main acting role, but uh, it was such a horrible film. <laughs> like not even like a good horrible film, like Evil Dead, just a pure, utter shit. <laughs> and uh, I ended up like Robert Downey Jr. like ad-libbing most of the lines because the script was so bad. Because I think it was like written by a Japanese director and then it was translated in English. And you know, you damn know that he was using Google Translate. <laughs> but uh, one scene I remember that I really liked was I pulled up a chainsaw and this was like my scene fighting the giant Bigfoot and he's roaring and he's like Bleh, ready to kill me and I'm just pull the chainsaw and I'm like, you dirty motherfucking furry loving freak or something like that. I threw in some big jab at fur furries and I loved it. <laughs> just total ad lib, like awesome. But anyways, so another actress from another film uh, we later found out, well, I later found out by someone mentioning other stuff that she had that weird fantasy. And how missed is that? Like, I heard that that one time by that, that, the main actress telling me that that guy told her that. And then I know another girl that was in that other movie that she said that to someone else. And I heard that. I'm like, God damn, what is with all the freaks in the industry? We got Japanese boy band groups being molested as kids we have michael jackson in the west we got fucking people killing themselves and japanese people saying that they're not m suicides they're murders on my youtube channel and then we got fucking more jeffrey epstein's in the west like man they're creeping me out being an actor and a comedian in this world um yeah, like, shit, what the fuck is wrong with the world, really, man? I was talking to my cousin the other day about, like, black widows eating their husbands and, like, praying mantises, praying mantises, or, or the woman fucking cuts off the guy's head during sex, and I'm like, the animal, or, the animal world is fucked up, but humans are really fucked up. And as a comedian, I feel like comedy needs to put these motherfuckers in check, but goddamn, we... We aren't doing our job, I don't think. The world is run on a muck and it needs to be put in its place. But it's also weird that like the Trump stuff and like storming the fucking capital and all that shit went down, but yet the the government and the Pentagon releasing UFOs and basically claiming that they lied to everyone for hundreds of years, well not hundreds of years, but like 1964 when the Roswell incident happened or whatever. But they admitted that they lied and then if you read this shit, again, I didn't, I didn't read fucking 2,000 pages, but I read a little bit of it. I was a little bit interested in this fucking corona and I have nothing to do, so, so sue me. 
But I read a little bit of that shit, and it was like, uh, they they basically admitted that they found a saucer that's not from this world, material they don't know, and then they say that they saw these UFOs flying, and there's no way that it's, like, human-made or anything that they know, unless fucking China made some crazy shit we don't know of. But yeah, basically they said it was aliens. And it's like, no one gives a damn. Why does no one give a damn? Like, I think that is more pressing than fucking storm in the capital in the u.s but every country is wondering about the u.s right now dude we might have fucking human eating aliens out there that our government is protecting us from and we have no fucking clue and then they're gonna kind of come down here and fucking sashimi us all god damn the world is fucked and not even that but like and i hate to talk about this negative shit but you guys gotta listen to this so even before they stormed the capital i remember hearing on the joe rogan podcast they were talking about like 72 children were found, rescued from a pedophile ring. And that didn't even make the news. So all of a sudden, people give a shit more about the White House, which isn't even in their own fucking damn country, and all this patriotism fucking bullshit that you're fed and the media brainwashed, and they give a shit more about that than the fact that 72 children were missing and found in a pedophile ring. And then there's Jeffrey Epstein in the pedophile ring. And people aren't. Karen? Like, I mean, pedophiles are so hated in the world that if you go into a jail where there are murderers and cannibals and fucking, like, the craziest motherfuckers in the world, they will kill the pedophile ASAP. Because as fucked as a person is, everyone knows that a child is just innocent as hell. And even nowadays, it seems like people care less about human children than they do baby kittens or baby puppies. And I mean, I love baby kittens and babies puppies too, but I mean, god damn people, there's no fucking kitten pedophile ring going around that we have to rescue them from. Fucking focus on each other. Man, that, that shit just blows my mind. I just don't get where people's heads are at right now and what is important and what isn't. Joe Rogan also did a really good explanation of like LGBT and um, being a minority and shit. And how, like, yeah, the white single man is now the most evil person in the world. But not even that, but, like, you get no excuse. It's kind of like how the Black Lives Matter versus the All Lives Matter debate. So, I mean, I agree with people that it's like, well, Black Lives Matter now, yes. But at the same time, it's kind of like Black Lives Matter because you can't say otherwise. Because this is now. And the way Joe Rogan described it is, it's like a poker game and you have poker chips and it's like, you're kind of raising up the annies, making other people fold. So it's like, white guy is like, oh, I think this is important. And they put like a dollar chip in the middle and then someone's like, well, I think this is important and I'm a Mexican. So oh, ethnic or ethnic, uh, ethnic, ethnicity. <laughs> Ah, uh, fuck, I can't speak to you. So anyway, so then they put two chips. And then they're like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm a black lesbian woman. And I'm a minority and another minority. So boom, I got more chips in the pot. And basically, like, people use, like, well, it's basically abuse of power. It's exactly what white people do. It's exactly what a Harvey Weinstein, who became, like, a, whatever he was in power, and then he uses his power to get what he wants. It's the same shit. So, I mean, these guys that are doing this are the exact same as the Black Lives Matter is this and this and this, just in a different form, using power or leverage to get what they want. And I was like, dude, wow, that was deep. I never thought of that. Like, comparing it to poker, it kind of gives it more of a clear image of how it is. And it's just, it's really weird and messed up the way that we are thinking recently. And, um... As a comedian, though, I fucking love it. <laughs> uh, I was watching a little bit by Louis C.K. the other day, and he goes, yeah, white privilege, you know? It's fucking great! He's like, if you were white and you went anywhere back in time, everyone would fucking love you. But if you're black, you could probably only go about to the 1980s. <laughs> it's, it's fucking funny, but it's so true. But, I mean, at the same time, it's like, what was it? My ancestry is fucking Danish. So, I mean, I'm a white guy, but I got nothing to do with the slave trade. We were fucking Vikings. We were slave trading fucking British people and white people. 
white people were our slaves. And just, oh, I don't know, the world is messed up and um, we need more people ripping it apart. Richard Pryor and them and, and uh, Sam Kennington in the 70s and 80s. And in the 90s, we had a bunch of people and in 2000, pfft, comedy just went to shit. And now com comedians are just talking about, oh, if I say this, I'm going to get canceled. Bill Burr tried to do some shit and then they tried to cancel him, but he's Bill Burr, so he didn't give a fuck and he just made it out there. But many comedians just can't do that. So props to Bill Burr, but now people are tiptoeing. And even before that, I was listening to another, or no, a new book I'm reading, sorry. I can actually read books, I know. And uh, I'm reading it and they're talking about like how in the 1950s there was people that were using like words about sex and shit. And then that was too much and they were getting cancel culture, but then they paved the way for other people. But in the 2000s, oh no, and that was the other thing I want to talk about. So people to get a movie or a TV show, they got to be a clean comedian, like a Jerry Seinfeld who never says fuck or shit or sex. I mean, if you want to get into a Disney movie, you probably don't want to be saying the shit Louis C.K. does. But if you want to be a real comedian, you don't censor yourself. And uh, recently as a comedian and performing in Japan with people that have performed in China and all over the world, um, I guess my shit is too risque. And people have been up to me and they're just like, dude, yeah, don't do gross out stuff for laughs. And I go, I don't do gross out stuff for laughs. I do gross out shit because the world is fucking gross and I say it how it is. And I don't know, they were like, when I go up on stage, I don't give a shit about what other people think about my comedy. I know what I'm saying is funny to the people that I want to make laugh. And that's what true comedy is. And people are like, no, you want to get jokes and make everyone laugh. And it's like, no. I mean, Louis C.K.'s shit is so gross that he has his own audience. Not everyone goes there. But enough people like his shit and want to hear that shit that people will go. Another example was my mom. She was like, oh my god, your comedy is so much like Andrew Dice Clay. I was like, holy fucking shit, thank you, mom. And she goes, no, I hate that guy. And I was like, he's the only comedian to ever sell out Madison Square Garden. He's fucking amazing. That's like the, one of the biggest compliments you can ever give me, mom. Thank you. And she was like, eh, well, I don't like him. And I was like, god Damn, woman, you try to put me down and you put me up. Thank you, mom, for once. And just, that's kind of the thing. And recently I've decided I'm cold heart, dead set. I'm getting out of Japan. I'm going back to Canada. If the Canada scene is bad, I'll go right fucking to Texas with Bill Burr and Joe Rogan because I got to be around people that are like-minded. And no matter what you do in life, if you have people telling you, what you're doing is wrong or that you got to do this, but you believe in yourself and you believe in what you do, you got to get the fuck away from those people. People will drag you down. It's really sad recently, but what I noticed with Corona too is people that, I mean, I thought were friends or I could treat as a friend, just flat out fucking ignore me or they don't care. And when I'm down and out, I'll make a sad post. Well, not a sad post. I'm not a pathetic loser, but... Uh, well, I don't know what to call it, but like, I not negative either, just not super upbeat happy. And I'll do a post like that on Facebook. No comments. No one helping me. No one discussing with me. Not even a fucking thumbs up. But if I post a movie about my new commercial, all of a sudden fucking 300 people are giving me thumbs up and shit. Huh. Like, good friends are really, really, really fucking rare. Like, when you watch Friends, for example, yes, I watch Friends, I think that they're great actors and it was funny, whatever. But when you watch Friends, for example, six friends, and they've been together for a long time, they get together, they fight, they get back together. If you can get that, holy shit, have you got it made in life. Um, any rock band, for example, too, kind of like that. It's, uh... Just, wow, man, I wish I had that. But I got maybe like one, two, three good friends like that now. Probably even just one. Sean at the Storytell Now. I'm now on YouTube. Like, uh, 
I know, I got more than that. But I, I don't know, you gotta get people in your genre, right? Like when I moved to Japan, people that I thought were my best friends and shit just never even messaged me. Because people go on with their lives and if you're not in that live, you just don't matter to them. And it's not even that you don't matter, it's just you don't relate and that it just doesn't work. Because people are on a linear path, right? And uh, unless you branch out or, allows, or unless your job allows you to get around, there's just a lot, a lot you can do, right? And that's the sad shit about life. And that's why people should always be reaching for hire. My one buddy back in Canada, he worked the night shifts at uh, Walmart. And he did that for five years, which is perfectly fine. It's fine. But he wanted to be in a metal band and he was great. And unless you put those posters out and grind, you never get it. And that's kind of one of those things someone talks about, like being settled with life. Like you just, you're happy with what you got that you don't want to go out and get it. And it's weird because I was like that in my 20s. I don't think I actually fucking lit a fire under my ass until I was like 30. And that's when I was like, okay, I got to go all in for my dream. And that's why it's crazy to hear about like comedians when they're 18, like Jim Carrey, like growing up as a kid and just being funny, practicing in the mirror, going to stand up comedy, blah, 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 blah. But people have different paths. Jim Carrey got booed off stage and sucked and never liked stand up. He used it to jump and get into and live in color and then became like a TV comedian, as you'd say. No longer a stand up comedian, per se. I still think he is. But uh, when I first did my stand-up, I had a nick for it, and I did great. But unfortunately, it wasn't when I was 18. I think I was probably 20-something. And uh, I don't know. It's weird. There's a lot of pressure to be 18. Like, I even was asked that once, too. I applied for a Japanese agency here in Japan, and they go to me, and they're like, why are you applying at this age? Why didn't you apply sooner? And I was like, because I fucking lived in a different country? Because I didn't know about Japanese comedy? Oh, well, we're sorry, we have a late age limit. They, they had an age limit in a Japanese comedy agency for fucking 25, I think it was. And I was like, dude, if you're a foreigner, you go to university, you graduate university at 22, 23, whatever, and then you expect them to be fluent in Japanese in a year or two? After that, or during? Just doesn't happen that often. And with Japanese comedy too, when I first watched it and I started getting into it and I started loving it, there was something I realized about comedy and being a comedian. And that is, you either got it or you don't. And if you got it, there's two factors because anyone can be funny, but working on yourself, bettering yourself, making jokes and that dedication, that's a comedian. But then the other part is getting on the fucking stage, being like, a fucking barbarian with your sword up high going Rah! and charging the crowd. Eh, you know what I mean? That's a comedian too. Public speaking, I think it was something like more people fear public speaking than they fear death, I heard recently. And that blew my mind. More people are scared about talking in front of people than dying. Huh. Like, my first time really speaking in front of many people was at a Japanese junior high school where I worked and I spoke in front of like 300 students and like 10 teachers and I was fucking terrified, but I did it and I didn't fuck up that bad, but I did trip on the steps on the, on the way to the, like to the speech podium and everyone laughed and I fucked up, but I still did it. Now that wasn't something I practiced. That wasn't something, you know, I got into. Um, I hate being around like hundreds of people. I just walked down to Shibuya today and there were so many people and I don't know why, but I was sweating up a storm and I had anxiety. And when I get on stage, I'm still nervous and I have anxiety and many comedians are. But the fact that you get up there and you grind and you push through your, as Joe Rogan says, bitch butterflies. That's what makes a successful person in life. And just getting on stage and doing that is one thing. And as a comedian to get to the top, you gotta fucking grind. And yes, I didn't do it when I was 18. And some comedians I found out later on, they started at 18, but they took two, three year breaks and shit. 
So it's weird, but like I got this weird trauma by the Japanese agency saying, oh, well, you're too old now. And now I'm worried about like age being a factor, but age is never a factor, man. Harrison Ford, I think, was in his 40s when he got the job for Star Wars, and then that led to Indiana Jones, and then boom, this old guy was killing it. So it's just, I don't know. A lot of people always say, well, don't listen to that person, just keep going, and that's just overplayed. It's just do it. Nike style, do it. Not rape, though. Don't do that. That's not a just do it. You gotta, you gotta be like, uh, excuse me, can we go on a date first? And then, excuse me, can we go to a hotel? You gotta do that correctly. But everything else, rape the shit out of it. As long as it's not a person, just rape the shit out of it. You wanna be a comedian? Grind, rape the shit out of it. <laughs> That's my new Nike slogan. Just rape it. <laughs> Ah, uh, and that's the other funny thing. So I was talking to someone the other day too. So, and stay with me here. Rape gets better. <laughs> it's, uh, I was talking to my cousin, that was it, who I'm hoping to be on the podcast soon because I'm starting to think that the 20 people that listen to this are getting bored of just me talking. And I do wish I could talk to more people. Anyway, so. So in university, I studied a book and it was about laughter in Brazil in the... Favela, I believe it's called, the poor area of Brazil. Every day people are k killing each other, stabbing each other, fucking breaking into people's houses and holding knives to their neck, asking for money from people. Just everyday chaos. And it was this story about like this one lady and every time uh, bad shit happened, like in the book they're interviewing her and she's like, yeah, my, my cousin just got killed in the street, shot dead to get, someone stole his wallet. That's why. Shot him in the head, took his wallet. And she's just like, yeah, it was a bad day. And she started laughing. And the lady's like, fuck. This bitch is crazy. Why are you laughing? And she kind of like explained it through discussing without outright saying it. But basically in Brazil, these people use laughter as a coping mechanism for sadness. And I kind of think that's a lot what comedy is too. So when we say rape jokes or Louis C.K. to an extreme about like pedophile jokes, it's not glorifying pedophile or glorifying rape. It's talking about taking control of this bad thing so that you can laugh with it and deal with the real shit when it happens. Whereas a lot of people want to plug their ears and go, no, 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 it didn't happen. That person didn't get raped. Not 72 children rescued from fucking pedophiles. We have a fucking lighter topic to talk about with the president. No. Bitch, open your eyes. That's what life is. And then if, and ah, uh, there's just so much shit to talk about with that. Like Nirvana, Nirvana song, Rape Me. I said the Japanese pronunciation there. Nirvana song, Rape Me. This is a weird story, but when I grew up as a kid, like six, seven, eight years old or whatever I was in 1997, that was, I guess. Yeah, like 13 or 14 or whatever. I don't remember that. I'm bad with numbers. But anyways, when I first heard that song, Rape Me, I fucking loved it. I don't know why. I love that song. And my mom was there and she hated it. She thought it was about rape. So she was trying to like tell me that I couldn't listen to Nirvana. She was telling me that song was bad and I shouldn't listen to it. Sorry, my hair is way too long. I keep brushing it out of my eyes. And uh, I don't know, I still love it now. I listen to it almost every month. And as Kurt Cobain said himself, he goes, it's not about rape. Or, I mean, it is, but it isn't. It's about like a girl that got raped and she's just like, fuck you, fuck me. Fuck you then, rape me, bitch. Just bring it at me. If there's nothing I can do, then I'll take control of it and not give you the pleasure or the power. I have the power. Kind of thing. I'm probably really terribly describing it, but that's what it is. It's like a come at me, motherfucker type thing. And uh, shit, what was the other thing I wanted to talk about? Oh, that was the other thing. Talking to my other buddy about the similar thing is movies. For example, in Japan, they have a cartoon called One Piece where the character smokes a cigarette. And in the animation, they show it. It's a children's show and the guy is smoking a cigarette. And if you're watching the video, I don't know why I go like this. It's like a faggy way to do it. I never smoked, so whatever. But anyway, so he smokes a cigarette. But in the Western version, they turn the cigarette into a lollipop because they don't believe that kids can fathom in their brain that smoking is bad and let them decide for themselves. And same with uh, other Japanese anime and shit. You'll see people dying and people killing and fucking... Yeah, really weird. Like, 
well, weird to us, but like eight year old, five year old cartoons, there's like their best friend dying and crying in it. And it's because Japan, and I think rightfully so, don't hide the real shit of the real world to kids. And if the kid learns about death and shit from an early age, they're more stronger to when they see it on the news or when they hear about it or when some shit, bad shit hits the fan in the real life. Like me, I loved horror movies. I watched horror movies since I was like four years old. My mom accidentally put one in and I kept watching it and watching it. She tried to get me to watch Sesame Street and I was like, no, 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 that person dying was funny. And uh, I ended up watching that VHS at the time like every day and she fucking hated it. She eventually had to break it and let me cry it out because she didn't want me to see violence. But the truth is, because I grew up on horror movies, um, if a monster came at me, I'd know how to deal with it. If there was a zombie apocalypse, I'd know how to deal with it. When there's a serial killer or rapist or whatever, I learned how they dealt with it in the movies, so I'm kind of like, oh, well, I got a basis idea of what to do instead of panic and fucking run away and let people die or whatever. It made me strong. And I think the same goes with those animes in Japan and everything. The more that we shield people, the more crazy it is. Long story short, comedy has to be that way too. And that's my opinion. And a lot of people disagree with it. But you know what? I bet you if they pulled some science shit out and like statistics, they find I'm right. Or all comedians, because I mean, that's the battle we do. But all right, guys, we're running up on the 30 minute mark and I decided that one hour is too long. So we'll keep it to 130. We're talking about fucking cannibalism, comedy, uh, bitch butterflies, and just getting on with your life. Um, times are tough. And uh, we talked a little bit about suicide today. And uh, Japan recently is also 16% up on suicide. 16% up! That's insane! And, you know, I talked about it before and a lot of people criticize me for this. But um, I just don't really respect anyone that commits suicide. It's a burden on their family and it's really lame. And I've had people that suicided in my family and shit too. And I just... You can't respect them. You still love them, but you can't respect that shit because it's a coward's way out. And, uh, yeah, the samurais were a bunch of cowards, I think, with their seppuku. <laughs> but anyways, guys, it, <laughs> what a dark tone to end the podcast on. Um, what's some happy news shit? What's happy news recently? I'm reading a good book about comedy that's opened my eyes. About 1950s and... Actually, all around comedy, a lot of the Saturday Night Live goodies. I think it's called uh, some, Poking a Dead Frog. I recommend that to any of you that are interested in comedy. And it's basically other comedians being interviewed and talking about how comedy has evolved and how SNL and like Seinfeld and Parks and Recreation and all that, they interview like uh, script writers from that and they talk about the script writing process and basically how the shit we love get made. And that's one thing too I always notice like, the writers never get the respect they deserve. You watch fucking, I don't know, a Marvel movie or something, you're like, ah, oh, damn, Chris Pratt is so awesome. Or uh, Tony Stark, Iron Man, man, every freaking thing he says is hilarious. Well, guess what? Well, not in case of the Tony Stark, he ad-libs a lot of this shit, but most of that stuff is from the script. The script makes the characters just as much as the actor makes the characters, but the actor gets all the credit. Kind of sad, but that's how it is. So anyways, yeah, I'm loving the script writers and like the creators and shit. And that's really getting me motivated to write my own script for comedy. And just, uh, I love paying respect to them and knowing and hearing their stories. A lot of cool stuff about National Lampoon and Monty Python in that book too. And I'm just fucking blows my mind. It's so great. But anyways, guys, thank you so much for staying and listening. I hope you enjoyed this as much as me. If you guys enjoyed it, leave a comment down on YouTube or something. Because I guess it's, for those of you that are listening on the podcast, you can't really do that. So visit the YouTube page just to lay a comment if you want. But anyways, guys, thank you so much for listening. This is Some Dumb Gaijin, and I'm your Some Dumb Gaijin JJ. But we're all dumb gaijins in Japan. All right, till next time, guy. Peace. I really slurred my voice recently, aren't I? <laughs>